So with this video, as we wrap up HVAC controls, we just wanted to acclimate to the different types of control drawings that you may see out there that may be handy both in following a design or being a part of a control project, or if you're looking at an existing building and trying to use that documentation to understand more about your system. So we'll typically find a number of helpful things out there. So we may find tab documentation that may tell you how a pump or a fan system was balanced. You may find subcontractor drawings that say for a control system show how they implemented their end of things. We're looking in this video specifically at some of the design drawings that may be out there. And you can find some of these design drawings in AutoCAD form at the following website. So some of these we've looked at already. So we looked at control logic diagrams and we explained how this is the graphical representation of the HVAC sequence of operation in these logic block control loop formats. So this is very important to spend time on as we did, both because to be part of a design, we need to be able to interpret these blocks and how they infer some sequence of operation. And also because as we get into programmable controllers, there's usually some interface that allows us to edit or build logic in this way. So they may not be included in every control project, so you may not have this documentation necessarily to review, but where you do it makes for a very robust controls project. So you may have the sequence of operation in this narrative form here, and this works best when you're supplementing the control logic blocks, not necessarily replacing them, because a controls programmer would have to take these words, fill in some blanks, or use their own judgment to build control logic blocks in the programmable controllers. So it's handy to have both, but where you have the sequence of operation it's nice to be able to have this plain words way of communicating what these systems should do. We also looked at some control schematics and saw how condensed these were with information. So with a something like a system diagram backdrop, you have an overall look at your system and you have all of the different points, the inputs, the outputs tied to the controller, as well as what goes to a safety switch, what type of manual gauges you have to look at your system, and what the point naming convention is. So each system should have this schematic representation with some of those standards about input, output, and how we name our DDC points. So ladder diagrams we haven't really talked about yet, and that's going to be this, this ordering of the commands in our system. We'll see them with motor control centers, so where you may have something like an air handler supply and return fan. There might be some safety switches where we want to see that we're bypassing the automation si signals so that where we have a manual emergency switch or a smoke alarm or some type of temperature low limit or pressure high limit associated with the system that all of those separate from the automation system are in series with that motor control center and can be cut off and not bypassed by the automation system or by some type of handoff auto switch. So we have more or less here wiring diagrams that show that proper order or sequencing of control signals, safeties, and manual overrides. So we also have schedules. And we could have something like an occupancy schedule. And when we use that term, schedule, here we mean table. So it's some type of table of information. And with the occupancy, we have things like the system that that occupancy schedule is associated with, the different times for unoccupied and occupied, if there's a warm-up and what that default schedule is, and something like how many sensors need to be manually pressed at the zone level to bring on that airside system or bypass the schedule when it's unoccupied. So we could have other schedules. We might have these thermostat schedules. They give a lot of information about where the thermostat goes to, the spaces it serves, some of its features. Possibly most importantly, we have these valve and damper or more on the actuator side schedules. And that can be helpful not just because of the location and the tags that they correspond to or how those valves and dampers are labeled, but as we look at this sheet, we can see that we have a really good naming. We have information on the type of valve involved. The range and the CV and the close off pressure should all be annotated during the design. And this is going to be very happy. This is going to be very convenient, rather 
for O&M purposes when it comes time to replace that valve in addition to helping the design review process. So same thing here at the bottom with our control dampers and the information that's provided there. We could also have UMCS schedules. So more specific to how things get integrated or the operation at the front end level, we could have alarm contact information or routing group information. So what the routing name is, when different people, different groups get alerted for different types of alarm and how to alarm them, as well as some computer information. So IT equipment that is not specific to the installation or the non-controls IT, but for any computer or router information or any other IT specific to that facility controls system could be annotated here and some of the addressing information as well. But really the most critical thing that we could talk about from as far as these design drawings are going to be the point schedules. So there's a lot in these point schedules and it can be a lot to take in at first. So we're going to kind of break this up and look at some of the different columns, how they're used and why they're important. So for right now, we're going to focus on the left half of these because we can really break down different operating parameters with different front end type use points and how they're used. So if you look at our unified facility criteria, we have different definitions for all of these elements inside the point schedules. And we're going to use those to go through some of these. So the UFC starts by talking about what the point schedule is, what it's used for, and who's responsible for filling out different ends of it, as well as all these different headers. So we're going to go over some of those definitions here. So the first thing that we see all the way on the left of the point schedule is that it's organized by function. So where you have different points that serve the safety part of the sequence of operation versus some control loop like temperature or flow, or if it's part of some miscellaneous set of points, it may be at the bottom. We have some name, and here we're following the same three-point naming convention that we've talked about earlier. So that should be annotated in this table as well for consistency. And finally, we'll have some description of the point. So a half a sentence or some type of phrase that indicates what that acronym stands for and what the system point is. So next we get into quantifying or qualifying different DDC point settings or ranges. So where we have set points that may be directly recorded on this point schedule and where we have ranges for those settings or input ranges, those would be annotated as well. So things like set zone set points or some switch settings or some type of occupancy mode, those would be included on the range side. And there's also a column for IO type, so the different input output type that we've seen. So the input output could either be analog or binary, also called digital. So you may see this AO, AI, BOBI. Or on the controllers, you might see a universal input or output. So controller manufacturers have figured out how you can configure an input or output physically on their controller to do either analog or binary. But for this point schedule, we want to indicate which we need. There's also network variable points. So they might be called NVI, NVO. You might also see net in or net out, and those are indicating where a point needs to leave or be received by a controller over the building control network. So some lawn or back net or protocol specific network passing those variables. We also see handoff auto requirements for different points. So this can be important for set points. And it may not be immediately obvious which of these controllers has that handoff auto capability. So it's actually the top two here in different ways. So on the left, we see this interface screen and the buttons and the dial associated with them. So here would be one way that we could do our handoff auto, assuming that there's configurations for those points to be able to put them in some type of manual mode and determine their real-time value. On the right, we've indicated where we have these physical switches. So here we can put a physical switch into an on or off position, or where it's an analog point, there's a little bit of a screw that can be adjusted so that you can go through that analog range. So if you want handoff auto for specific points, the point schedule would be the place during development to e indicate that. 
So that's the makeup of this left half of the point schedule, where we're dealing with a lot of establishing points associated with a system and different control loops or elements of that system, and then finding a way to record the settings and some of the other operating needs of that system. There's a lot of acronyms, and we've listed some of them here, and we've gone over some of these three-point conventions for DDC names. But another thing you may notice is some of the symbology. So you see different brackets and symbols and other information that has specific meaning on this chart. So some of these entry terms. Well, the first thing you do is where you know information, where you know what points you want and what some of those set points may be, that would be directly put into the point schedule before it even gets to a designer. Where you see an X on this table, that's indicating that that is functionality that is required. Where you see this tilde symbol, that's indicating that there is no entry here. There could be, but for this project, there is no entry required. Where you see an NA or possibly some shaded box, that's indicating that an entry does not apply to that particular location. But really most important is going to be these brackets. So there's two types of brackets that we see on the point schedule. There's these square brackets and then the angle brackets. And those are going to indicate who's responsible for putting and recording what information on different parts of this point schedule. So just as an example with this left half we've been looking at, we can notice a lot in the settings and in the range columns. So if we look at the zone temperature control loop, you may notice in the settings column that we have this bracket set around this 82 degrees. So what that's saying is that there's a default 82 degrees that is assumed to be the zone temperature set point for unoccupied periods. So almost like a, if it gets too hot, run the system or put the, break the system out of unoccupied mode. So somebody assumed 82 might be the right number, but the square brackets indicate that this is a designer responsibility to accept this default number or change it to something else. Down here, under the same temp loop, we have these angled brackets. And there's some of the same default, and then there's some blanks as well. Whether there's information in there already or whether you have this blank for the different commands at the bottom, that's still indicating that it's a contractor requirement, specifically a controls contractor requirement to record this information. So this may be things for this column that the controls contractor is going to figure out on site. So what the dead band may be for a particular loop and what those P and I settings would be for dampers and valves, that's really specific to the system that you'd figure out during install. And we indicate that with these different bracket types. So you may notice with that type of setup that this is a document that is not necessarily in one person's court. This is a document that you would start with in development. It would go to a designer with certain requirements they may have. It goes to the controls contractor that would then annotate their information. And then it would go from the controls contractor to a UMCS system integrator that would ten then take those points and use them to integrate that system to a front end so you can have different front end capabilities. And those different capabilities and how, they're, how some of the addressing is accomplished is shown in this right half of the point schedule where you have different display, trend, override, and alarm functionality shown. So again, the UFC will spell out some of the functions and some of the columns in this point schedule on this right half, but we could look at some of the column information at the header and probably figure it out. So we can start with the LDP and MNC display information. So LDP starts, stands for local display panel, and MNC is monitoring and control which is really synonymous with the front end. So if you want to have certain points displayed locally at that local display panel, you'd indicate with an X or in some cases a V for view. Same thing with the MNC. And you probably have more at the MNC than you would at your LDP. With the MNC, we also have trending capability. So do we want to indicate for a point where we want to have that trend capability. So keep in mind, this isn't the same as indicating what the trend length and the trend interval we may want to have, that may be more part of a monitoring plan during commissioning or during existing building commissioning. But here we're just indicating where we want to have a point that's trendable. So we also may want specific override capability, limited at the LDP, but maybe a little more expansive at the MNC. 
So here's an example of an LDP on the left where we may have this small display panel and some of the touch buttons right at a control panel in the field or in our mechanical rooms. And on the right, this is really what we would call the MNC, is having these front end graphics where we can viewpoints, override them, and perform our trending. And we also have alarm requirements annotated on this point schedule. Everything from what the condition is that triggers the alarm, what the priority is if it's critical or informational, as well as what routing groups that alarm goes to. Next we may have some protocol specific information on this point schedule. So what's shown here is very specific to lawn or lawn works. When we talk about node address, that is indicating things like domain, subnet, or node, which may be tantamount to something like city, street, and building number. The node ID is a unique identifier, and the snippet type indicates the type of network variable, because when you do things like bind devices or connect them over the network, they need to be the same type. So that's really specific to flat lawn or LNS systems, this type of terminology. With BACnet, we might use terms more like BACnet objects. And with Niagara, we're using some of the same BACnet or lawn terminology at the field level, but we may have additional information such as the Niagara ID that needs to be put into this point schedule. So different systems have different point requirements associated with them. It also may be dependent on the features included in those systems and how much you may want to trend or view or override some of those particular components. But you can find at that Graph Talk website different point schedules specific to each system may be included in control projects or smaller retrofit efforts. Okay, so that wraps up our HVAC fundamentals. There's one practice exercise we have here to kind of hammer in some of these controls concepts that we covered. But after this, we're going to move on to some of the more RCX-specific skills in our curriculum.